Hello, and welcome back to Real Seekers. I'm your host, Dale the Real Seeker, and back by popular demand is Dr. the um, former uh, Biblical Unitarian, now skeptic, Dr. David Kemble Cook. Hello, David. How are you? Hi, I'm fine. Thank you, Dale. Awesome. So we had, a, a, for people uh, in the audience who are wondering, um, David was supposed to be here last weekend, but there was a bit of a time zone uh, kerfuffle, so I ended up talking to myself uh, for much of that. But uh, the good news is David did not see any part of my um, evidence for the empty tomb. So this will still be a surprise and, and new for him. So, But yeah, uh, David, what's your how, how's your Easter doing on your end? Oh, it's, it's been very good, thank you. Um, yesterday, my daughter and I, we went to the garden centre. We got lots of flowers and uh, her twin died aged three months. So every so often we go down and uh, we decorate the grave with flowers and you know, plant things. And it's looking lovely now. So, um, so yes, it's been, it's been good, thank you. Um, and I have an Easter egg that I haven't started to eat yet. <laughs> Unlike the rest of my family who have gorged themselves sick. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like me. Yeah, I've, yeah. I've definitely, uh, definitely gobbled down my Easter eggs and all that yeah. stuff. So, <laughs> yeah. all right, cool. Well, yeah, so today, obviously, it is Easter Sunday. And so we're going to be focusing on a question relevant to Easter. Uh, specifically, you know, David Casey has been bugging me and David Russell and, and Tyler for What's the evidence for crying out loud? Let's let's get to the evidence. Why do you believe the resurrection is true? And so I want to start today with specifically the evidence for the burial and or empty tomb of Jesus on on Easter Sunday morning. Um, so on that front, um, I guess I'll David. How do you want me to do this? Because I've got slides. Do you want me to go over everything or? Um, okay, you know what? I'll split this up. Yeah, so I'll just, just to save time and we can go back and mm -hmm. forth. So let me share my slides. Um, okay, so. Um, okay, perfect. Awesome. So is that showing up there, David? Please yes, see. I can see it. Thank you. All right, cool. So. In terms of establishing the historical facts for Jesus' resurrection, I remember uh, where we left off. In terms of the question of historical sources, David Casey was willing to grant um, the general historical validity of Luke and Acts and uh, Paul's authentic epistles that, you know, like the seven to eight epistles and creeds. Um, so I'm primarily going to be taking my evidence from those sources and restricting myself just to those sources, because that's what David Casey accepts. Um, there may be some additional sources of warrant that are, are surprising, but for the most part, I'm going to stick to the historical sources David Casey gives me. Also, David Casey has admitted to me in an email, he already accepts the validity of the fact that Jesus died by crucifixion. So I'm not going to get into the evidence for that. This is David Casey already assumes that. And since I'm trying to convert David KC, why argue about something he, he already agrees with? So the next fact is, okay, was there a burial and or an empty tomb on Easter Sunday morning? Or is it as David KC says, was Jesus simply dumped in a common pit and or grave? Well, uh, as you guys know, my friend Gary Habermas has written his massive volume one of his new book on the resurrection. And in that book, he provides a total of 13 evidences supporting the burial native narrative and 21 arguments supporting the empty tomb. I think he missed one uh, that I'm going to be bringing up here today, so it should be 22. Um, but I'm going to select some of the main ones for today's purposes. So the first one um, is, is um, in terms of the plausibility of a burial in a tomb versus a pit. Well, we have historical arguments from Josephus proving that the Romans did make exceptions for Jews and allowed them to bury their crucified victims in family tombs, and even doing so before sunset, just like the Gospels say happened with Jesus. And here's the quote from his book, Jewish Wars. Um, they, um, 
okay, actually went so far in their impiety as to cast out their dead bodies without burial. Although the Jews are so careful about burial rites that even malefactors who have been sentenced to crucifixion are taken down and buried before sunset. Uh, this is not talking about a common pit. We also have arche archaeological proof. We're, sorry, did you say something, David? No? No, 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 I'm listening, yeah. We also have archaeological proof with Johannin. In 1968, this was a crucifixion victim, his heel bone here with the nail still embedded into it. And Johannin ben Hadkol, after he was crucified, was buried in a first century family tomb in Jerusalem. So we have proof that this, that this claim of Jesus is plausible, given the historical data. Um, now, what about specific evidence in favor of Jesus' burial? Well, before I get to that, uh, let me turn it to you, David. Anything very quickly you wanted me to go over in terms of these plausibility arguments? or No, no. I, I mean, it's, it's possible that, that, that Jesus was buried in a tomb. I just think it's unlikely. But, um, but no. Um, by the way, you said at the beginning that I accept that accepted that Luke and Acts were, were accurate. Well, I, I could not have meant that because, of course, you know, Luke mentions burial in a tomb. Um, I, I think I might have wanted to say that the author of Luke and Acts does appear to strive where he can for historical accuracy. But, of course, in relating to the resurrection, he, he's not a, a witness of that. So he's relying on stories uh, and things that people told him. But otherwise, yeah, please go on. Gotcha. Okay, cool. So let's get into the direct, a couple of the direct proofs. And here's, here's the surprise, David. So I'm bringing in a couple of archaeological proofs. Um, so one is the Nazareth decree inscription. Um, I, I understand this is controversial. Wait till you see my case, though. Um, also, there's another archaeological proof from the Church of the Holy Sepulchre as the Golgotha site. Um, I think that that there is good archaeological proof that has convinced secular archaeologists, as we'll see, that this is the actual site of Jesus' tomb, if not his crucifixion. Um, we also have or evidence from an oral creed. Again, so uh, David has generally accepted uh, 1 Corinthians as one of Paul's uh, authentic letters. We have an oral creed that predates that letter by decades, um, going back possibly to six months to about five years or so. But in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 to 4, it says Jesus was buried. And that, that specific word for buried, as we're going to see, constitutes proof for the empty tomb. And there's a, a second argument there, too. Um, fourthly, I'm going to do N.T. Wright's sufficiency argument. So he's written his 700-page book. Basically proves that, look, the disciples believed in a bodily resurrection. Uh, in, uh, appearances alone cannot explain why they believed in a bodily resurrection. It had to be empty tomb plus appearances. Neither alone were sufficient. And then finally, we have the good old favorite, the strongest one, the criterion of embarrassment, whereby the women are said to be the first eyewitnesses of the empty tomb. Uh, and that's embarrassing for the early church. So it's probably true. Um, any any questions or do you, do you want me to get into it? David, or we'll we'll be getting into those, won't we? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. So so let's do the first archaeological proofs, and then I'll I'll come back. So the first is the Nazareth decree inscription. So you can see a picture of it here. It's a marble slab, written by uh, found in Nazareth. Uh, it's an imperial edict, or technically, it's what scholars call a rump version. So it's a copy of the official edict sent by the emperor, sent out in the provinces and regions there. Um, either from the reign of Tiberius or Claudius is the traditional Christian claim, with a strong warning about meddling with tombs and graves and stealing bodies out of graves. The punishment was death, capital punishment if you did this. Um, so obviously Christians come back and say, well, hey, this is proof of the empty tomb, because the emperor, whoever made this edict, Tiberius or Claudius, obviously heard about Jesus' resurrection from the dead and they heard counter points from the Jews talking about how the disciples stole the body. So that was the impetus for making this edict whereby he makes it uh, illegal to steal bodies from tombs. And here's a, uh, the mainstream translation by most scholars today 
in terms of translating this edict. You know, so it is my decision, graves and tombs, whoever has made them for the religious observances of parents or children or households um, that remain that these remain undisturbed forever. Those who have been buried or has been moved with wicked intent, uh, who have been buried to other places, committing a, are committing a crime against them, or has moved sepulchre sealing stones. That's Jesus. That's what happened in his case, according to the Gospels. Against such a person, I order that a judicial tribunal be created, yada, yada, yada. I sentence them to, to death under the title of a tomb breaker. So this is what the inscription actually says, fully consistent with the gospel empty tomb narratives. Um, now, what are some reasons we should think that this dates to the Emperor Claudius? Because the skeptics come back and they say, no, this is an imperial edict that Augustus Caesar made in either in 20 BC or another uh, candidate is 8 BC, where there was some rebellions going on in non-Jewish lands and stuff like that. So why do we date this to, to the Emperor Claudius in the early 40s, mostly? Well, there's linguistic arguments. First of all, the word Greek word diatagma, which means edict, is extremely rare in ancient Greek texts. There are only eight known examples. Interestingly, two of those eight examples are exclusive to the Emperor Claudius. No other emperor uh, has used that in the first century. A third instance also comes from the New Testament. Ah, interesting. Uh, in the book of Hebrews, chapters 11, verse 23. Also linguistically, um, there are several unique phraseologies in this edict that are unique to the Emperor Claudius. And uh, scholars have determined that a total of 70 out of the 90 words used all match the Emperor Claudius over and against other emperors. Um, there's also the argument from the Sitzim Liban and the criterion of illumination, right? So what was going on in the early 40s? How, why would Claudius care about stolen bodies in Judea in the first place? Well, on the first place, we had the previous emperor Caligula stirring up the Jews in the Holy land, put in that abomination of desolation in the temple. And uh, this was, he wanted a, you know, a pagan statue of himself in the temple. As you can imagine, the Jews did not like that idea. Um, and also had King Herod Agrippa, causing a lot of tumult. Remember, it's here where we get Acts chapter 12, a source again, that David is open to. Let's let's say that. He doesn't just believe it's gospel, but he's open to using this. A source, it mentions the martyrdom of the first apostle, the apostle James, the son of Zebedee, killed by King Herod Agrippa. And this was causing tumult amongst the Jews and early Christians in this period. Um, also, it provides a relation on why did Claudius expel the Jews from Rome, like Aquila and Priscilla? Remember, we have the historian, Roman historian Suetonius, telling us that the Jews were riled up because of Christians talking about Christ's resurrection or Christus's resurrection. And the Jews countered this by saying, what? Well, the disciples stole the body. That's why the tomb is empty. They didn't deny the facts of the empty tomb. And this created a bunch of a stir in Rome, so much so that obviously Claudius became aware of it and said, oh my God, how do I solve it? Fine. Here's an edict. You steal a body, you're dead. Don't touch bodies from family tombs and stuff like that. So those are the pros. Um, there's a couple of, uh, I guess just quickly, a couple of skeptical comebacks. Uh, Richard Carrier, he's a Jesus mythicist. He's not a serious scholar, but he does have a PhD in history. So he tries to mistranslate the thing and say, instead of religious observances, it's uh, talking about uh, the cult of the ancestors. So it's referring to pagans, not Jews, in this edict. But this does not fit Jewish. We, we've actually, modern scholars have proven conclusively this Greek word refers to religious observances, and that is strictly and uniquely a Jewish phraseology. The pagans didn't apply to them. And the same word is found in Josephus and in the New Testament. And I uh, you have Acts chapter 26, verse 5 there, one, one of the sources uh, David will uh, is open to. Um, and additionally, pagans didn't have family tombs or sepulchers in the same way. They cremated their dead and then buried or, you know, dug them in urns under the ground. You remember the Appian Way, you've got all those tombstones dotted throughout the road outside of the main gates. They did not have family tombs the way the Jews did. Um, so this is specifically proven to be talking about Jews. Richard Carey is wrong. There was also a 2020 scientific study that proved the marble 
for the edict came from the island of Kos. So they say, ha, ah, it has nothing to do with Israel or Jews. But what they don't know is that historians laugh at this because we have archaeological proof that the island of Kos was a major exporter of marble and had a special relationship with the King Herods, even having a gymnasium dedicated in their name on the island of Kos at the time, uh, whereby they imported marble to Israel uh, during this time. So it, it supports the traditional understanding, actually. And um, yeah, that's, that's it for the Nazareth inscription. Uh, David, do you want me to move on to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre or let you come back on this? Yeah, oh, well, yes, if we want to discuss this, it, that's very interesting. Um, but of course, it's not a proof of the empty tomb. And even if it were a proof that Jesus' tomb, if he was buried in a tomb, was empty, that doesn't disprove uh, a grave robber hypothesis uh, against which the edict would have served just as well. Sure. Yeah. The, um, in terms of the, so the way I, I split this up, historical sources, we covered that in the past. Today, we're getting into the historical facts. And then once we're done establishing what historical facts we have, that's when I get into the explanation. So you're quite right. Just based on this evidence, it doesn't speak at all to the explanations. Uh, maybe the disciples did steal the body. Maybe a grave robber did. Maybe a necromancer. May, maybe Jesus rose from the dead. It's it's not speaking to the um explanation for this fact it's i think it just speaks to the fact that there was an empty tomb that required this response from the emperor Does that okay make sense here? yep you're okay you're you're good with with yeah. that and do you see this would be good supporting evidence and i think even on a balance of probabilities does establish the empty tomb just based on the timing it would have been in the early 40s during the Sitzen Lieben uh, time. Uh, it helps. We can link it linguistically to Claudius specifically. And we know that he had problems from Suetonius between Christians and Jews based on the resurrection claims. And that's why he expelled the Jews. So we, we can prove he would have known about these claims. Um, I just think the best explanation would be, yeah, Claudius wrote this because he knew about the resurrection claim of Jesus and the counterclaim that people stole the body. And so he wanted to snuff that out. Like, look, I'm going to enforce this, this rule. You, you break a sepulcher seal, you steal a body, you tamper with a tomb, you're dead. Okay. Okay. I, I stunned him. Okay. <laughs> All right. Cool. And do you have anything last, lastly to say, or do you want me to just, no, no, let, let's move on. Okay. All right, cool. Now, this one surprised me as a Protestant who does not like to go for Roman Catholic or Orthodox man-made traditions. Um, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, I think, is likely been proven archaeologically to match um, the gospel data surrounding Jesus' empty tomb. Now, in the first place, we have a good argument from scholarly consensus. And I, I do want to be fair that there, there are a lot of scholars on the other side of this, including Gary Habermas, who in his book, uh, doesn't go for this argument. This is one that he misses. Um, and he, he's told, told me that the reason for that is because he, he just thinks it's too iffy in terms of scholars on both sides. But I do think that there is a, a good case to be made that there is a majority and or a significant number of secular archaeologists today who think that this is true, uh, including Protestants such as Craig Evans or philosopher Dr. William Lane Craig, who you can see his quote there, he says, in all probability, this is the tomb. We have secular archaeologists who have excavated this area specifically, like Dr. Shimon Gibson. Uh, there's also Dan Bahat, who was the former city archaeologist of Jerusalem. Um, Dr. Katerina Galor, another Israeli archaeologist um, who supports the authenticity of this site. And she, she provides her argument that the original set of walls, walls were later expanded by King Herod Agrippa between 41 and 44 AD. And this was completed before the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. So the archaeology and the gospel data fit knowledge of this specific Golgotha area that didn't exist after the 40s AD. Uh, so that's why she goes for it. Finally, we have Dr. Joan Taylor, and she she's my favorite. I, my arguments that follow are based on her article and her work, because she was a former skeptic 
of the Holy Sepulchre. She even wrote a book uh, talking about how the, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is not uh, Jesus' burial tomb. Constantine just picked it out of convenience. Uh, she's totally changed her mind after excavating the area and doing research and that sort of thing. And uh, now she does think that, um, so she says, quote, in her article, I, Dr. Joan Taylor, will argue that the crucifixion was indeed further south than the traditional site of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre would locate it, as I argued previously. But the tr site of the traditional tomb of Jesus may very well be authentic. And essentially her reasoning on this front is that she can prove, look, Golgotha is, is not some small isolated spot or a hill, right? And this, that didn't come about until the 6th sixth, sixth century AD when Christians are starting the rock of Calvary and, and the, oh, there's the little tip of the hill. No, in Jesus' day, Golgotha was a topos. That's what the Gospels use, meaning a region. It was a larger area. And there were multiple Golgothas during this early period, places of the beheadings or execution places. That's what it meant in Jesus' day. There, there is no Golgotha, the Golgotha. There's a region known as the Golgothas. Right, uh, so that's the Sitzum Lieben in um, first century times. Shimon Gibson and Joan Taylor have excavated the area and proved that it was used as an Iron Age quarry on a slope. And interestingly, topsoil has actually been found in various areas uh, of quote unquote the pit in this area, showing that this area was intensively farmed and used as a garden just outside the Geneth Gate. And that's atypical of this surrounding uh, region or topos. Um, most of all, what changed Taylor's mind from a skeptic to a believer is basically the self-evident nature of Jesus' tomb site and how that would require having knowledge from before the 40s AD of this area that is unlikely to have been preserved after the changing of the city by King Herod Agrippa, uh, as certainly after the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. And uh, after that, of course, the Emperor Hadrian with the Bar Kokhba Rebellion he totally revamped the site. Um, and, you know, basically there was no way to, to tell anything about what this uh, Golgotha area looked like during the time of Jesus. Um, apart from how did, well, how did Christians remember? They just said, well, we remember Emperor Hadrian put the statue of Jupiter in the temple of Venus on top of the, this point, this rock of Calvary. And that's where Jesus was buried. So here's just a picture from Joan Taylor of what the garden tomb complex or the topos of Golgotha would have looked like in the first century. Here's a, a, a layout of what she thinks. So this is during the time of Jesus that changed after 48, 44 AD. But you have the old North Road, the West Road. X marks the spot of where she thinks Jesus was crucified. And that makes sense, right? Because when you're crucified, the, the Romans want people to see you and mock you and laugh at you and say, oh, that criminal. Or if you're a rebel, uh, rebellious uh, zealot or something, they want you to see it and be afraid. Like, I don't want to end up like that guy. So um, on this front, she argues that uh, the traditional Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which is why up here, is not the site of the crucifixion in all likelihood. But it, it was archaeologically proven to have a tomb from the first century fitting the the nature of the God, the description of the gospels over here within a hundred meter less than a hundred meters of the church of the holy sepulchre which is site z uh so that that's her hypothesis based on the archaeology uh again just kind of representing that here's what the site looked like as of 150 a.d to the time of constantine as you can see everything the crucifixion site is totally under a roman road the temple of pagan Venus was over over the site and stuff like that. So it was it was purely just remembered that okay, well the pagan emperor uh, built this temple and put the statue of Jupiter, which is the Y, on the site around the site of the empty tomb. So you know they were slightly off, but within the same vicinity. Uh, so yeah, that that's that uh, that's that argument in terms of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. It's not absolute proof, but I, I think on a balance of probabilities, there's something here. Uh, what say you, David Kemble Cook? Yes, it's interesting, isn't it? Interesting, mm -hmm. uh, but as you say, it's not. It's not. It's not. It's not proof. Do you think it's proof on a balance of probabilities? Maybe. Well, it's proof that I mean, 
it, it suggests that there's a site there that was used for crucifixions and uh, then and if there's tombs there, okay so there were tombs but that doesn't imply that jesus was put in one of the tombs well she she argues because there's the preservation of the memory what why is it that christians mm. have preserved memory that could only have been known about this tomb complex as of 44 ad but not mm. afterwards or would be very unlikely afterwards given all of the uh remodifications of the city um mm. from the late late first century until the mid second century there um they just happened to get it right and this this is the the place where they remember jesus's tomb and crucifixion site which they got wrong right because mm. the crucifix she's saying the crucifixion site is more likely to be over here but they are preserving this memory that just turns out yep there's a first century tomb matching the well, who is the who is the people who who remembered the early christian church in the church okay. tradition yeah but they um they weren't um they would not have been uh when they were remembering this they would not have been in jerusalem would they when they were we're talking about is it the fourth century that the site was identified uh so you, do you mean by like constant time the time the church yeah. was built yes yes yeah three, 325 ad is yeah, when okay. helena uh came mm. to this spot she destroyed the temple and built the church of the holy mm. sepulcher uh, so yeah. right so so then but christians would not have been around in jerusalem uh would they at, at this time there were no there, were no there was no continuous occupation of the of the area by Christians, or I mean, they were, yeah, there was, the yeah. Christians left uh, Jerusalem before, you know, it's it said before that the, the city was taken by the Romans in AD 70. And That's then, true. as you okay. said in, in the um, uh, earlier, that uh, in the later destruction of Jerusalem, there would have been a mass expulsion of Jews, including any Christians that might have been there in eight, 135 AD. So, that's a long way to go to the fourth century to find Christians who've got a memory of the area and identification of this site. Because you don't have any, any Christians living, Christian community living there continuously um, over those, what, 200, 300 years. But, but David, this is, uh, so let me say charitably, in general, I agree with you, the bulk of Jewish Christians had, had gone out in the diaspora and, and, and left into other lands, but there has continuously in all times always been a Jewish Christian presence in Jerusalem. That's that's never stopped. It's not like, oh, there, if you go to the year 150 AD, there were zero Jewish Christians in Jerusalem. That was mm -hmm. never the case. Really? Um, I thought that the Jewish population as a whole was, was expelled uh, by Hadrian. But it's it's not. I mean, look, we get things like that. We we have proof of Jews still living in the Holy Land, Jews and mm -hmm. Jewish Christians still living in the Holy Land. Like think of the Council of Jamnia, that's in the Holy Land. And mm -hmm. I know it's not Jerusalem, but it's no. Yeah, no, I'm talking about Jerusalem. Yeah, we, we mm -hmm. have they they lived in Jerusalem as well. There, there's mm -hmm. I'm actually surprised that you would say that. I, again, mm -hmm. it wasn't like it was a bulk, like most Christians were Gentile. Once we get into the second century, that it's there's a specific uh, official no uh, term for it in scholarship, right? When the Gentiles overtake the Jewish Christians in mm -hmm. the second in the second century, but yeah, there there was always a presence, a minority mm -hmm. presence of Christian Jews in Jerusalem. From, yeah. Okay. Well, um, I, I I'd have to see a, a reference for that, but anyway, let let let's 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 take it, let's take it for the moment, and uh, but but anyway, let's carry on. Okay, uh, yeah, cool. So, so move on to the next evidence. Okay, so the next evidence for the empty tomb is a linguistic one from the oral creed in 1 Corinthians 15. And uh, again, this is a source that David is open to, let's say. So this, this is an oral tradition or creed found in 1 Corinthians 15, written by Paul in about 50 to 55 AD, depending on when you date 1 Corinthians. Um, in, in its oral form, it date back, dates back extremely early, according to the vast majority of biblical scholars. 
most probably representing eyewitness testimony and or is the, at the very least provably consistent with the eyewitness testimony within the first six months, Garrett Ludeman, atheist biblical scholar says that, to about three to six years after Jesus. At, at the very latest, whenever Paul came and spoke with Peter and James in Jerusalem, this creed or the content, propositional content of this creed would have had to have been formed by that point. Uh, in verse 4, the creed says that Jesus was quote-unquote buried, and this uses the Koine Greek word thapto, which very clearly and unambiguously indicates a careful burial in a tomb. It is not meaning representing a dugout space in the ground, which is what David T.C. argues for with his common pit or common grave interpretation. Impossible that this word represents that. Ancient tradition proves that the Greek word taphos and its cognate terms actually indicates a tomb specifically. Even the liberal New Testament scholar Dr. Dale Allison says, quote unquote, the verb used in 1 Corinthians 15.4 would hardly be used of the unceremonious leaving of the body to rot on the cross or dumping of it uh, into a uh, dumping of a criminal into an unmarked trench as dog food. That was not burial, but rather its denial nor is the verbiage consistent with not knowing where the body was placed. Um, then we have a second argument, um, and I'm going to link, I link to this guy's article for free, uh, biblical scholar Dr. James Ware, uh, from this, and he looks at another word, I think, risen, the word for risen or raised, and the linguistic meaning of the verb raised. Um, he makes a, a semantic argument based on this verb, that says this is used to denote resurrection necessarily entails the restoration to life of the body of flesh and bones within the tomb. This verb within the pre-Pauline formula thus denotes the rev revivication of the crucified and entombed body of Jesus. The assumption that the formula's affirmation that Jesus has been raised denoted a post-mortem uh, ascension to heaven, which did not involve the revival of the corpse, in the grave may be, uh, uh, okay, may, I've lost my, uh, my eyes suck. Um, anyways, uh, so yeah, so he, it, it is not possible, it is not a possible inference from the Greek wording of this ancient formula to posit an ascension, uh, is what he's saying, where the body would still be in a tomb and or was known to be thrown in the common pit. The, this verb risen speaks of and implies a tomb, from which the body awakes, arises directly. Uh, so that's this argument, the, the linguistic argument from these two words used in the First Corinthian Creed. Uh, any, anything on your end, David? Or No, that's fine. Carry on, please. Okay. All right. Um, okay. So next we have N.T. Wright's argument, biblical scholar N.T. Wright. This is his sufficiency argument, right? So Biblical scholar Dr. N.T. Wright has written a 700-page book proving this argument. The entire book just is this argument. And he proves that the early Christians taught a rather unique doctrine, namely that of Jesus' bodily resurrection from the dead on Easter Sunday morning. Wright then proves that there are a series of seven unique Christian mutations of Jewish belief into Christian belief that can only be explained by positing that Jesus rose bodily from the dead, not a spiritual resurrection. So some of these are, for example, the Christian theology of the afterlife mutates from multiple views under Judaism to a single uh, single view, unified view, uh, resurrection Christianity. Uh, also, the relative importance of the doctrine of resurrection changes from being peripheral in Judaism to absolutely essential and central Christianity. It's the idea of what the resurrection be like goes again from multiple views to a single view, um, an incorruptible, spiritually oriented body composed of the material um, of the previous corruptible body. Uh, most significantly, I think the timing of the resurrection changes from being all at once at Judgment Day to a split with Jesus rising as the Messiah as the first fruits, and then the general resurrection waiting till the end of till Judgment Day. Um, and as you can see, there are various other mutations. Um, I also give a list of seven other historical puzzles that are explained by postulating this bodily resurrection of Jesus. 
Now, here's where N.T. Wright gets into his kicker, because he says, belief in a bodily resurrection of Jesus would simply have been culturally impossible for Jews to believe in if all they had was the evidence of the empty tomb alone, but no appearances, or if all they had was the appearances, but no empty tomb. No, in order to have sufficient warrant for belief in a, that first century Jewish context, for believing in a bodily resurrection of Jesus, is if you had the empty tomb plus the resurrection appearances confirming that the body wasn't stolen after the fact. Um, so, yeah, that's that's his argument, is that, you know, appearances without an empty tomb is insufficient to explain bodily resurrection belief. You need the empty tomb plus this. Uh, so that's the next argument there. Uh, Okay, Dale. Yes, that that's very, that that's uh, that's very interesting, very comprehensive, and a good summary there of N.T. Wright. I I don't have to read his book now, do I? <laughs> there you go. There you go. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you, you saved you saved me a few months. <laughs> exactly. See, that's why I'm here. So, yeah. All right, cool. And now my last and final argument. This is probably the one I think is the strongest, as do the vast majority of biblical scholars, atheist, skeptic, whatever, even Bart Ehrman. Uh, up until his uh, traitorous change of mind on this this question. But he also, even now when he's changed his mind on the question of the empty tomb, he still admits, my gosh, this woman, embarrassing woman argument, this is something you got to reckon with, right? So basically it boils down to women were not seen favorably as testifiers in the ancient world. There's a lot of debate. Well, well, we have proof women could be used to, to testify in a court of law Sure, that, that's irrelevant. The, the point is, the general point of this argument is, women were not seen favorably as testifiers. The vast majority of men, of Jews living in the first century at this time, if you said a woman witnessed something, they go, Puh, what does a woman know, to quote the mummy? Uh, um, so this is an undeniable fact. Um, most scholars agree this proves the empty tomb, okay, and Gary Habermas in his new volume one book, um, if you go to page six hundred and Eight, I believe it is, on, on note number 28, he has over three pages, and this is one footnote of all the scholars and all their positions on the empty tomb and why they believe what they believe in a single footnote. That's impressive. Um, but uh, yeah, the vast majority do support this as a fact because of this woman argument. And with Luke in particular, because remember, uh, forget the other gospels, David Casey, he's open to Luke and that's it. So with Luke, we have additional proof here because Luke tells us his emphases when he's reporting. And Luke has men showing up to the empty tomb. It, it, he's narrating these things where it's just embarrassing. Why, you know, leave the woman stuff out and just start with the men appearing at the empty tomb and bending over Peter and John looking in and seeing the empty tomb. He didn't have to st tell the story of the women seeing the empty tomb first. And then running and telling the apostles and Peter, Peter and John, huh, what does a woman know? We don't believe you. And then they show up to the empty tomb and sure enough, huh, their jaws dropped to the floor. The women were right. Um, this is all embarrassing stuff. Now, some skeptics will like Bart Ehrman and them will like to come back and say, well, there was a re there were uh, theological motivations for having the women first. So for example, um, this is not relevant to Luke, but in the Gospel of Mark, for example, uh, he, he has an emphasis that the first will be last, the last will be first. So there's this mix up. Now that we're in the Messianic era, there's this mix up of the social order and stuff, right? So the people on the bottom will actually be on top and vice versa. And some skeptics have said, well, that's the reason they have the women there. It's not embarrassing at all. It, it supports what they want to hear. But Gary's response to this is just devastating. The cost is simply too high. Look, their main purpose was not a social political message. It was, we want to get your soul saved and going to heaven. And we want you to do, believe the gospel message that Jesus rose from the dead, central to that. And they would know that by putting women as the first witnesses, a major stumbling block to the vast majority of Jews and even Gentiles later on for who they wanted to witness to and to get them to accept the gospel message. The cost is simply too high. These second supposed secondary goals do not outweigh the main goal, and therefore the use of women would be embarrassing for that main gospel purpose. 
um, the vast majority of people would say, puh, what does a woman know? Shoot, if they don't believe the gospel message, they're damned and going to hell. Luke must be wondering, why the heck am I talking about women? I should just edit that stuff out and redact it out and just talk about Peter and John showing up at the tomb and problem solved. He doesn't do that. Why? Because he's interested in historical accuracy and being truthful. And it just so happens in God's providence, women were the first witnesses of the empty tomb. So it's probably true. Uh, that's it. That, that's my case. Okay, thank you. No problem. How, how'd I do? <laughs> oh, well, it was very, very good presentation. Thank you, Dale. You've got a lot of information in there. And uh, you've summarized right and the archaeological evidence very well. And the embarrassment point, I, th I think, is uh, does N.T. Wright make that point? I, I think he, he might does. do. Yeah, he does. Yes. Too. yes. Yes, indeed. So um, do, we, we have to consider then we, we're comparing, you know, our, our probabilities, aren't we? We're, we're, we're thinking what's more likely, you know, which hypothesis, uh, resurrection or not resurrection, explains the evidence better. I think I think that's what we were, you know, in terms of Bayes' theorem, which we were talking about earlier. It's the it's the ratio of the two, isn't it? It's what we call the Bayes factor, which which we're trying to find. And historians do this all the time. They uh, they work for, from a principle known as inference to the best explanation. So you're comparing explanations and and, uh, and judging which of them provides the best. Uh, Sorry, sorry, comparing hypotheses and and uh, and comparing which one of them explains the evidence best. So um, so we, and and we, we agreed, I think, at the beginning or last week or, or recent weeks that that I'm open minded on this, which I, I genuinely am. I'm prepared to believe in a miracle. I don't believe miracles are impossible. And so I would say to being being open minded and rational. I would say that the definition of that is to be uh, to accept that um, uh, a 50-50 chance, if you like, or a, a probability of a half, or a, a prior probability that a, a resurrection happened. So the question is: Is the evidence enough to tip the scales? That that's what we're talking about. Is it more likely than not that a resurrection occurred in this particular instance? Right, so the um, the the balance turns upon the uh, so we've obviously uh, we don't need to discuss that that the um, that the evidence that we have is certainly explained by a resurrection. That that's certainly true. The question is, what is the the credibility of any various alternative hypothesis might be in explaining the evidence? So you have, remind me how many pieces, of, how many lines of evidence that you had there. If you could get that slide up, the, the oh, introductory slide. Yeah, it's uh, so I, I recorded only, so Gary Habermas has a total of 22, 21 in his book, and I add a second one, so 22. There are 22 uh, pieces of evidence proving that the empty tomb is probably historical. I highlighted five. Uh, so if you, let me just go back to that. Um, so I, I outlined five for you. Okay, yes, so here we are. Yes, right. So, okay. So, yes, so we got this decree, which uh, is, I think anyone would agree, is perfectly consistent with Jesus not having been raised from the dead. And David, can I, uh, so I just wanted to respond to that. Sorry, I'm so sorry to interrupt. But uh, mm. so, so I, here's a point of agreement. I totally agree with you that great, even if you grant the empty tomb by itself, like N.T. Wright argues, that's insufficient to prove that the that Jesus rose from the dead because maybe the disciples stole it, maybe a necromancer yeah. stole it. That is an equally probable explanation, um, I might argue, even if I grant everything, grant me the empty tomb and stuff like yeah. that, um, that could be equally explained naturalistically without positing a resurrection. But remember what I'm doing here in this part. And um, in a future show, I may provide, when we get to the explanatory level, I may provide some considerations that I think says that the resurrection is more probable to those alternative explanations. Uh, we'll have to wait and see. 
right here, I'm just trying to establish that the fact that there is an empty tomb. We're at the factual level, not the expl explanation level. So I don't care about resurrection. I, I'm trying to prove that there was an empty tomb historically. That's all my... Okay, so, so that's, that's our hypothesis then, is that, yeah. uh, that under... All oh, right, okay, so that's clear. All right, so the decree, does that show that Jesus' tomb was empty, that there was a tomb and it was empty? I think it probably does, and um, because because of the fact that we can link it to the Emperor Claudius around this specific point in time, where we know from independent evidence, you know what was going on with Claudius, why he was getting riled up between Jews and Christians on this specific claim about the resurrection, and we we also know again from the, how the Jews responded to this, saying that the disciples stole the body or someone stole the body. It, it seems to fit that sits in Lieben. It, it illuminates the other evidences that we have. Um, and it, it, it fits. And therefore it, it probably, the best explanation, I think probably, again, it's, it's not very strong evidence, but I think it is more probable than not that the best explanation is there. Jesus tomb was empty. Christians and Jews were fighting over this and Jews were responding by saying, you guys stole the body. This enters the the hearing of Claudius when he he's dealing with these rebellious Jews and stuff and expelling them from Rome, and so finally just okay fine I'm going to make this edict you steal a body in in this land of Judea then you're sentenced to death don't mess with sepulcher ceilings ceilings don't touch bodies in tombs or the death penalty um, I think that that probably shows there was an empty tomb and it's talking about well, Jesus. It, um... Okay, Dale, but then it's the, the decree is also consistent with there being a, an epidemic of grave robbing. It's uh, so I, I think that the uh, edict itself could be, but don't forget there's the surrounding evidence, right? Like where we know that Jews in particular would be, this is aimed at Jews in particular um, who are causing rebellions because of. Uh, Claudius's predecessor Caligula and Herod Agrippa doing certain things, um, and we we also know about uh, in Rome itself the specific debate that was riling up uh, Claudius was about this resurrection claim between Christians versus Jews. Um, so we have that specificity. Your your hypothesis that there was a mass epidemic wouldn't explain why would he just make an edict for in the land of Jews uh, instead of making this rash epidemic for for outside areas and stuff? No, I, I just mean it in possibly in in in, in Judea. Uh, maybe there was a lot of grave robbing in Judea, and um, but we if, if there you're assuming that that the emperor had special knowledge of the Christian belief, which I don't think there's any evidence for. It's in and, I don't think we've got any evidence that Claudius knew of the claim that Jesus had risen from the dead. Um, this is a general edict against grave robbing. Suetonius, actually, he's a Roman historian, yeah. and he tells us that Claudius, the reason he expelled the Jews from Rome was precisely okay. because the Jews were being riled up yeah. okay. due to Christians talking about the resurrection of Christ, and they're countering that the disciples stole the body. So... We do have evidence that he... Okay, sorry, that. sorry. Yes, I didn't know that story. Yes, yes, I, I'll accept that. But okay. but even so, I mean, it's a general edict against grave robbing. So yep, that's um, true. It's, it's not... And, and I don't see, you know, post hoc, how it would um, have any relevance to the controversies over between... Uh, among Jews about the Christian belief. It's... Uh, <laughs> It's, yeah. uh, it's years after the after the alleged fact, and the Jesus, uh, the empty tomb, if it if it was empty and was a tomb, was only one instance. So it could hardly account for, you know, um, why should it warrant an edict against grave robbing going on into the future? I mean, if it was a, a Christian belief, is that this was a one-off event? So why why um, why should it apply? What purpose would it have? if it was solely directed against the Christian belief? I think because, again, the emperor, the pagan emperor Claudius is, 
not a stickler for details in terms of Christian theology. He just knows the issue of contention causing problems between the Jews and Christians in his city. And that's this difference between the resur resurrection, body missing in the tomb, versus the bodies missing because the disciples stole the body. And so that's what he's focused on. For all he knows, okay, maybe, maybe they're going to, what's next? When Peter dies, are they going to steal his body and I'm going to have to deal with mm -hmm. another thing? Like he, he, I don't think he understood mm -hmm. the fine nuance about, well, there's a unique resurrection. Jesus is the first fruits okay. of the general resurrection. I don't think he okay. knew any of that nuance. And yeah, so, so it's, it's, it's really speculation, isn't it, Dale? About no, what Polybius might have known or might not have known. Well, I, okay, so let me, I will admit this. Look, it's it's obvious from, from the translation here that there is no explicit association with Jesus, right? O obviously, he doesn't specify, like, oh, this is because of Jesus. That Jesus has an empty tomb, so I'm making this law. So there, there is no direct, explicit proof. But I think given the sits and leave in arguments, it's a circumstantial argument. And I think on that front, it does work. It's weak, but I think it works on a balanced probability to push us beyond agnosticism. I, I think it's unlikely that a rash of grave robbing in Jerusalem caused this versus Jesus' empty tomb. Just given the circumstances of the, the extra biblical evidence that we have, um, I don't know, but, you know, at least like 60% or something like that. Like, I think it's, it's a more than 50%. What, what would you say if it's a circumstantial argument? Does that? No, I, I agree. It's circumstantial, and it and it's evidence for other hypotheses as well. Uh, that uh, that uh, that that it was profitable to steal bodies. So, so bodies were stolen. <laughs> bodies were being stolen. Um, so, if uh, yeah, so, so I think we should move on because I mean you're agreeing it's it's weak. I, I do agree that it's it's weak. I, I think when I evaluated it, I I gave it at most between sixty to sixty five percent. That I think it proves Jesus's empty tomb specifically based on the circumstances that surround it. I, I mean, mm -hmm. circumstantial evidence does count as evidence in a court of law, but despite what you may hear on TV and stuff, right? I mean, Teddy Teddy mm -hmm. Pappas, who's a criminal lawyer, has proven that you can use circumstantial evidence when there's enough enough of it all conspiring towards a certain thing you, people have been convicted on purely circumstantial cases so well I, yes and some of them have been found to be innocent afterwards when dna evidence has come there was a man uh, recently in britain who's um who's uh, suing for compensation because i think he spent 14 years in prison for mm -hmm. a crime he didn't commit and he was co he was convicted solely on circumstantial evidence but later DNA evidence proved that he was innocent. I think that's a, that's a fair point, right? And that's why you, you've got to be careful with weak yeah. circumstantial arguments. But that's not to say that we can't convict. We, we can and we ought to convict on compelling circumstantial cases at times. And we mm. follow the evidence on a balance of probabilities. So if, if there are enough unique sets of circumstances that really suggest, yeah, probably... Um, this uh, this is speaking of Jesus' empty tomb, rather than a rash of like grave robbing in Jerusalem all of a sudden, which we have no external evidence for that at all. Whereas we do with the Jesus hypothesis in Suetonius. Well, that's, yeah, I mean, there's the, obviously the evidence of the Gospels there, uh, but but Dale, the, your sixty percent. We were talking about this earlier. Uh, it's oh, th this sorry, is yeah. like. Um, I shouldn't have mentioned that. Sorry. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I really do want to come back to you at an appropriate time about what you mean by this sixty percent. If we're yeah. using Bayes' theorem, we we should be thinking about I think what's called the Bayes factor, which would be a ratio of the the degree to which the evidence um, is explained by the hypothesis of empty tomb, divided by the the um, the degree to which uh, the evidence is explained by alternative hypotheses like you know a rash of grave robbing in, in gotcha. Judea. So right. that, would be a ratio, that would be a ratio which you, you know you you would you would want to say would be greater than one to to make your empty tomb 
more probable, not 60%, which is an actual straight probability. So we might want to come back to that. You know, no, I, to, I, uh, I want to avoid the, the math. So I, I apologize. That was my fault to bring in another yeah. math math debate. But I, I just wanted to give a sense of like, you know, like how, how strong am I? But uh, mm -hmm. for, forget the numbers for this show. So okay. my apologies. But OK, so, okay. so let's move on to uh, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. What did you make uh, make of that? archaeological case yes well i mean the supposition is that you know you've got this you you've made the hypothesis that there's a community of jewish christians continuously uh from um from the time of jesus death all the way through to the fourth century which have got a, a continuing folk memory that this uh, was the site and i think that that's questionable you've had um we, 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 there's evidence from, um, I think, Josephus, isn't it, that that uh, Christians left Jerusalem before the 70. And in any case, there was a mass exodus at that time. And then there was another mass exodus in AD 130. And you claim that all this time there was a community of, of um, Jewish, Jewish Christians living there. And I don't know, is there, is there evidence for that? I've, yeah, I, I'm pretty sure that there look i i know for a fact no one posits that every single all jewish christians left jerusalem after 70 ad that's just not how it works i i um trying to find a a source so like okay here here's what joan taylor says in terms of how the tradition works i'm gonna have to look up i don't have proof offhand like a source proving it unless i do a google search for it right here now in terms that there was this continuous um, uh, community of Jewish Christians in Jerusalem, um, just offhand, but I will look it up and find it because I, I am a hundred percent. I have no, forget the percents. I, I have no doubt in my mind that there was always a continuous community of Jews and Jewish Christians living in Jerusalem. And no one with a PhD that I can think of on any front would deny that much. So I'll look into it. Um, I'm trying to, I'm searching the article now because the, the way that the tradition was preserved, according to Joan Taylor, and maybe she's got this a source talking about Christians living in this holy land here, is um, basically because of the garden. That's how after 40 AD, when uh, Herod Agrippa changed the, um, the layout of the land, the Christians preserved it by knowing where this garden was, because it was unique and only in this, in this spot, according to archaeological excavation. So that's how they remembered the general vicinity of where Jesus' tomb was, even after the city got a facelift and the, the temple walls were expanded and stuff like that from G back in the 40s. Then in 135 a a AD, um, um, obviously, I mean, well, yeah, there's historical proof right there. The Bar Kokhba Rebellion, Rabbi Akiva. What, what are Jews doing in Jerusalem with the Bar Kokhba Rebellion? after 70 AD that, um, and they talk about, I think they talk about complain about Christians living in Jerusalem and how they weren't of any help or something, right. Talking about the, how it never rained or something like that because of them. So that, that might be a historical source that I just remembered off the top of my head, confirming the existence of Jewish Christians and Christians. I mean, Bart, oops, what is uh, Bar Bart Ehrman, he talks about Jew now they're heretics, but they're Jewish. They think they're Christians. The Ebionites living in Jerusalem around 90 AD in the Holy Land. So, yeah, as far as I know, no, no one denies that. Um, but yeah, so, so they preserved it through this garden. Then in the time of Hadrian, he gives it a total facelift. You saw that picture of the Temple of Venus and all that. That came in the second century. Christians preserved the memory by knowing that they they put this temple there and the statue of Jupiter um, was their, their kind of m marker that we know historically Christians used to remember the site. And that's what the Christians pointed to when Helena came a couple hundred years later. And they, they said, oh yeah, Jesus' tomb and crucifixion site, it's under the statue of Jupiter. The emperor Hadrian wanted to stick it to, to us just because he didn't like us. So he... Uh, he put the statue over there to mock us and built this temple on the site of Jesus thing. So that's how uh, the memory was preserved, according to Joan Taylor's research. Um, mm. Yeah. Well, 
the link. I'm looking at the um, just the Wikipedia article about the Bar Kokhba revolts, which uh, it's the first time I've seen this, but you can see that um, it says Jerome says that, uh, what does he say? Jerusalem was completely destroyed and the Jewish nation was massacred in large groups with the result that they were even expelled from the borders of Judea. Uh, and then it says here, Jews were expelled from the area of Jerusalem. And then uh, and every village in the region of Judea whose remains have been excavated has so far been destroyed, had so far been destroyed in the revolts. So um, it's, they, they say it's widespread destruction and uh, mass expulsion, slavery, uh, Jewish captives were sold into slavery and sent to various parts of the empire. So it's uh, you've got the 70 events and then the 135 events, and uh, which militate against continuity of a Jewish Christian community in that area. Uh, and uh, it that, says here... That, that source proves my point. It says widespread. Widespread is not absolute and complete. I mean, we know this mm. from even the Old Testament times where they exaggerated and stuff like that. So there were some people still left, right? If if it's widespread, that's okay. Uh, it's a big majority of people were wiped out and had to leave in the diaspora. Nobody denies that historical fact, but it doesn't mm. say all. Um, no, I'm just saying, it, I mean, it's, I think it's, uh, I mean, it's, it's not impossible at all, but I think it's tenuous. I, I, I honestly don't think it is, but, uh, Okay, in so definitely, uh, yeah, 130 AD is talking about a banishment and stuff. So obviously, Christian Jews were there after 70 AD. But yeah, I, I tell you what, in my blog, um, I will find this because I am so confident that it, it's true. I just, I don't have anything on the tip of my tongue to, to show you, but I will look mm -hmm. it up and provide evidence for this claim. But cool. And if okay. the, Ringo or Mr. Jetty, if you know of any uh, sources that mention it, put that in the chat mm. and I'll raise it up. But okay, cool. Um, so yeah, so that's the so that's your objection on the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is that the tradition couldn't have been preserved because there was this interruption. So okay, um, I'll need to refute that and provide sources then. Okay, right. So uh, back so to the uh, back to the list. All right, so the third argument, and I'll bring it up in a second, it's the linguistic argument from the 1 Corinthians 15 creed, uh, where, if you're seeing that, uh, based on the verbiage, the, the word buried implies a careful, proper burial in a family tomb. It cannot refer to being put on a cross or thrown in a common pit, and also raised, which is James Ware's argument. Um, there we go. Uh, that implies being in a tomb, rising or awaking from the dead. And, you know, what the body, same body that goes down comes up. But there is this impl implication there, according to the verb use, that there is a tomb. It's not just talking about a common pit, uh, nor is it just appealing to some kind of an ascension into heaven spiritually or something. Yeah. Okay. Right, Dale. Yes. So no one doubts that the early Christi early Christians believed that Jesus had been buried in a tomb and also had been raised from the dead, having left the tomb empty. Okay. That's their belief. And certainly the creed or that passage reflects that belief. But that doesn't imply that that what they believed was true. Okay. So it's only, okay, so it's only their, their belief, so isn't it? Uh, uh, correct. Um, now that's huge though. Why? Because we can push it beyond belief because then, then it's a question. You're, first of all, you're saying Paul wrote this within 20 years, uh, so early, uh, 20 years, and he knew the eyewitnesses. He probed them. So he would know if this was BS or not from the eyewitnesses. So you're going to have to ascribe the eyewitnesses uh, very early. Scholars date this six months to like three years after the resurrection you're saying the eyewitnesses, how did they get fooled about seeing an empty tomb? Did they just, do you think they were just lying and made made this up? Because we can track this back very early 
to Peter and the apostles, the eyewitnesses themselves. So unless you're saying they, well, they just all made, they just made it up so early on. No, I, I don't think so. No, I think there was a, a genuine belief early on that Jesus had been raised from the dead. And, and uh, but when we think about Paul, what Paul says, nowhere in his letters does he actually testify to a bodily resurrection, nor does he actually mention an empty tomb. So all, all we've got is that those those choice of words used in that passage, haven't we? Got the buried and the raised. But nowhere does you say that Paul has spoken to the eyewitnesses, but he doesn't actually report what the eyewitnesses told him. Yes, he does here. So, okay, uh, I'm just trying to find something to write down. I'll, I'll just remember it then. But, okay, cool. So there's this objection that I didn't prepare for today. We can perhaps follow it up to, uh, next week when we have Dave, or next time when we do a show with David, and yes, sure. I'll, I'll bring them back. But let's address this because I think we can prove Paul did teach a bodily resurrection, not a spiritual resurrection. But for the sake of argument here, um, I, I can even agree with you about Paul. But who cares about Paul? This is a creed. Paul is reporting for I delivered Pharisaic language. I delivered what I received. This is formal, oral, controlled oral tradition, so to speak. And this is from the eyewitnesses. How, how do we know it goes back to the eyewitnesses? Number one, we know, proven fact, that in the early church, in this early time, authoritative oral traditions came from the Jerusalem church. There's no question about that. So if there is a creed, it came from them. And that church is what held the eyewitnesses. Second, A second argument is that we know Paul himself uh, went to Jerusalem to visit Peter and James, the eyewitnesses, and he inquired for 14 to 15 days, I think it was, inquired like an investigative reporter is what Gary says the Greek word means there all the truths about what happened and that would have included whether there was an empty tomb or not so you yes we can link this very early to the eyewitnesses in Jerusalem and if you're going to agree they were teaching this empty tomb that and that's not true that's very problematic because either they were directly lying which I don't think I think we can prove they couldn't get away with making up a lie like this in Jerusalem uh, at this early time. No, I, no, I don't think, no, I, I would agree that I, I don't think lying um, is is consistent with what we what we read in Acts about, obviously there had to be really firm belief based, you know, as the basis for their preaching uh, in the resurrection. But, um, but what I'm saying is that Paul doesn't tell us. I mean, we'd really like to know what Paul heard from Peter and James and the others, wouldn't we? We'd really like to know. It's these improbables, like, you know, we'd really like to know what uh, Jesus told the disciples on the road to Emmaus about all the prophecies about the Messiah dying and rising again. We'd really like to know because uh, we, we, we can't really see it in the Old Testament. And we'd really like to know what Paul learnt. And, and, and we'd really like to have seen, seen somewhere in Galatians, for instance, or Romans, uh, a passage where Paul tells us what the, the apostles told him um, about the empty tomb and the bodily resurrection, but we don't. We don't have that. All we've got is this one phrase, which isn't Paul's. Uh, you're saying no, but we. Uh, we know so Paul is actually reporting what he's been told yes, by exactly. some, someone else un unidentified. No, but well, we know that it was the apostles who told him because number one. Only the apostles in Jerusalem, like Peter and that, could mm -hmm. make authoritative creeds yes. where, where Paul would be saying, I, I delivered and I received. There okay. has been biblical scholars proving that there is this formal yes. controlled tradition from their authority. And secondly, yeah. we know Paul spoke in Jerusalem with Peter, Peter and James directly and inquired about, about everything. So if they, if they told him there was no empty tomb and then some other guy, some random guy, told him, no, well, here's a tradition about an empty tomb. He would have said, get out of here. Peter told me there was no yes. empty tomb. I'm not going to record yeah, exactly. this. But, exactly, but Dale, he, that's right. So we'd really like to know um, what, what what Peter and James and the others told Paul. They, they told and, him he was uh, buried, which proves you know, um, I mean, it, he, it would be really nice uh, from, from the Christian point of view to have this passage saying that Jesus was buried in a tomb and uh, he... It, it the tomb does. was found empty, oh. but that's not what he says he received. 
And um, so certainly we, if we accept the moment that buried means in a tomb, and if we accept that this was an early statement of Christian belief, which for the sake of argument, let's do that, then um, I, I, it, it's quite, I, I would say to counter that, that just because it was an early belief doesn't mean it's true. It doesn't take long for myths to grow up at all. I mean, we've even got, you know, um, examples today in the age of the internet of beliefs growing up over a matter of, you know, weeks and, and months. I mean, some people believe it's a matter of fact that Donald Trump won the last election and a good percentage of the population of the USA appears to believe that, you know, but um, and, and that's where we've got voting evidence and everything, you know, digital records. And uh, so these these stories don't take long to grow up. This is just a matter of a few years, isn't it? And even within weeks, Trump supporters were claiming that the election, he'd won the election. But that's um, totally irrelevant. And, and that people, believe, people believe all kinds of things for all kinds of reasons. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think we're getting onto the resurrection here, but, you know, I'm inclined to go uh, for the moment with what Paul Ogier says, which is that all, all we need is a couple of people with a really firm belief that they'd seen Jesus. And that would be the seed to set off a, 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 a general belief amongst the disciples that Jesus had been risen and would explain these these stories about appearances, group experiences and so on. But that's on the resurrection, which we're not talking about today. Yeah. So I'm just saying it doesn't take long for myths to grow up. You know, we don't need um, 10, 20 years for something inaccurate to enter. Uh, we, a story about a tomb could take weeks or, or maybe months to 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 start circulating. And if it's not denied by the apostles, then it gets accepted. And okay, get so into a creed. And we said, as I said, we don't have Paul is not actually telling us that there was an empty tomb. And he does never says that there's a bodily resurrection. Indeed, in the rest of that chapter, when he's talking of himself and not reporting, as you say, a creed, um, he what he says goes against the bodily re resurrection. Uh, although we're not talking about the resurrection today, but you, you can see he talks about, no, it's not bodily. It's not the same body. It's a spiritual body, he says. Right. Um, so that is a bodily resurrection. I, I'm going to save that debate. Yeah, but it's not It's not the same body, Dale. It's not the same no, body. It, it is. It is. I, I, it's a different I, body. It's a different body. Okay. Read 1 Corinthians 15. Okay. So, okay, so here's my final response on this. And uh, if you want the last one, I'll give it to you, and then we can move on. Or okay. moment, whatever you want for this for sure. you. But. Yeah. Okay, bottom line is with what I presented here today, regardless of what it means to have that spiritual body, is, is that meaning it's not a physical body? We're going to debate that next show because I can prove it's a physical body. So let's save that debate. But the point is here, it is talking about an empty tomb. It is talking about a physical bodily resurrection when it says buried and it says raised. And in terms of the raised aspect, I'm going to link to this paper by Dr. James Ware that conclusively proves it in my opinion, in a peer-reviewed journal. Uh, so I want you to read this article by James Ware, and maybe we can continue. Like, did you get convinced by this? Because he makes a conclusive case that this is bodily resurrection, and that implies tomb here. But the, the other argument is about this word buried, where this automatically, the verb used, uh, thaptico, has to imply, as the majority of biblical scholars imply, a, a known tomb location that and a careful burial in that tomb it can't be dumping of a criminal in an unmarked trench it can't be just leaving it up on the cross to rot um this this creed whoever gave it to paul does talk about the burial and through jesus raising because that would imply the connection as james ware argues of the bot same body that goes down is the same body that rises up if that's true as these scholars argue then that proves there was an empty tomb because the body left, it rose and left. So I think this does prove that there was Jesus' tomb was empty just based on these two verbs alone and the arguments that the majority of scholars lead. Now, where I agree with you, I do agree. What, what about the source of this creed then, right? Because you're, you're saying it's just some, Paul got this from some random peep or something like that. And I agree that, Look, you give examples there in terms of oral traditions, there are different models of oral traditions and how they work. 
this has been proven by psychologists and sociologists and anthropologists. There are different models. So something like Trump, that's that's an informal, uncontrolled oral tradition. So of course, you you know, you have the game of telephone among kids and stuff, these unrestrained, uncontrolled, informal processes. But that's not the case with these. That this is a proven formal controlled model with student specified designated student and teacher an authority had to deliver and paul as the dedicated student had to receive this tradition from an authoritative source the only authoritative sources of creeds were the apostle peter and the jerusalem apostles that was it in this time so he got it from the eyewitnesses and if you say you don't believe they lied then that means yeah they taught the empty tomb and were telling the truth there was an empty tomb unless you think they could have been deceived. Did they hallucinate the empty tomb as well? I, I don't know. But secondly, we also have that argument that Paul met with the eyewitnesses in Jerusalem and probed them about Jesus' resurrection for 15 days. So if some later non-Jerusalem apostle, non-eyewitness gave him tradition, number one, he would say, nope, I'm not accepting that tradition from you. You're not an authority. And secondly, you are contradicting what the, uh, the Jerusalem eyewitness apostles are saying, because there is no empty tomb, and you're saying there's an empty tomb. So it, it is highly unlikely that uh, Paul is just getting this from a random person, that it is the fact that the eyewitnesses in Jerusalem taught there was an empty tomb. They weren't lying, according to you, I agree. And it's very unlikely that they were hallucinating an empty tomb, and that explains why they would claim it. No, I, I think positing an empty that there was an empty tomb is by far the best explanation but uh, well yeah know. it would be yes yeah, still i mean it would be good for your case if uh for instance the reports of the visits to jerusalem in galatians uh, supported um the first visit after three years in galatians one he paul says he only saw peter of the alleged eyewitnesses and then then 14 years after that or after 14 years, which could be 11 after that, he again, he went to the, the, the gospel. He went to the to see um, the, the apostles there, the disciples. And but he talked about the gospel that he preaches, not about their evidence of the resurrection. Nowhere does he actually say that I, I learned from them eyewitnesses about the resurrection. He doesn't even mention the resurrection in either passage. And in fact, whether Paul you know, you say Paul was was the student and they were the teacher. Well, the evidence from Acts is that it was very different. In fact, there was um, often sharp disagreement between Paul and, for instance, Peter over his gospel, over the gospel. And very Peter, Paul does not assume the status of a, of a student there, but of an equal or indeed possibly a superior. Uh, so... Um, Okay. So, you know, there's evidence against that, your hypothesis. I mean, we don't have it clearly stated um, that the relationship was of this kind. Yeah, and I want to address these because I, I am kind of pushing them to the side in this show, but I promise I'm going to remember this. And let's next the next time we come back together, let's continue and let's ask this general question. Can we prove that Paul teaches a bodily resurrection versus a spiritual resurrection and stuff like that? Like we can... Uh, we can get into that issue because I know that you deny that. And I, I'm just saying these two texts, I think we can prove it's a bodily resurrection, but you've got other texts that you think countermand that and stuff. Well, I'm, yeah, I mean, we've got the absence of, of texts of, of, of Paul, um, you know, witnessing or saying that he's got evidence of a bodily resurrection. The okay. fact that he in fact does not speak of a bodily re resurrection indeed is, you know, the, 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 the chapter that we're talking about, it, it talks about resurrection in completely different terms, seems to speak against it. But let's go into that. Uh, on the next time. Time. Yeah, definitely. I, I okay. totally disagree with everything you said. And um, yeah, like I said, the, these two, these arguments here provide the first case proving what you're saying is, is wrong. So I, yeah, I'd be interested if you read Dr. James Ware's paper, for okay. example, uh, I think it's revolutionary. Um, I'd like to get okay, look, I, I, fine. I, I certainly look forward to it. You'll put that in the. Uh, will you send your of your slides with the uh, the show notes as yep. well? Yep, exactly. And I always post it up on my blog mm -hmm. for people because sometimes I have 
notes, not on the slide, but in the like notes section with links and stuff. So, that, yep, I'll always send you this okay. and, and post up. All right. Okay, okay. I'm running out of time now, Dale. So, um, okay, very get back to the okay, very the quickly. List. Uh, NT writes uh, sufficiency argument. Uh, I'll just let you get get your final words then, since you have to go. So, yeah. okay, all right. So, time. yes, indeed, I, 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 that that seems logical to me. And as I said, you've saved me reading 700 pages, so that's good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, and and but but of course, um, we we've we've um, for appearances and empty tomb, we may substitute belief in empty tomb and belief in appearances, and the argument goes through to belief in bodily resurrection. In other words, we could put a belief in in front of those two terms on the left hand side, and it's the same. It's a, still a valid equation, isn't it? Uh, or you know, any any um, argument of this kind uh, is is equally valid if instead of the alleged event happening, you have firm belief in the event happening, would give the same results. Can I, can I just one follow up? I, I know I promised you I wouldn't interrupt or say anything. I, uh, this is your word, but. Just a question like that, that doesn't seem real. Like we don't just get beliefs popping out of nowhere. They are caused or explained by certain things. So that's that's why it's well, absolutely. Like yeah, absolutely. And and if we take the gospel's record as as um, substantially correct, which for the sake of argument, let us do that, then in all the synoptic gospels, uh, it's recorded Jesus telling his disciples that he would be crucified and would rise from the dead. Gotcha. And, uh, and this is then kind of confirmed, I think, later on when after the resurrection is reported, the disciples said, yeah, did he not tell us you know, before? So we've got explanations there for why um, people believe. But we're getting on to the resurrection again, which uh, we we um, but the empty tomb, indeed, uh, as to why, you know, if they found a tomb empty that they believed was Jesus. Oh, he's been raised because he told us he'd be raised. For instance, um, but um, so all, all belief. Uh, what I'm saying is that belief in something happening. Yes, it could have been caused, but there was if there was an expectation or a, you know a memory of Jesus having told them that he would be raising that there would be, and then they had a an experience. One or two of them had an experience. Uh, they believed a possible a grief hallucination. That they saw Jesus, uh, which you know is reported. These things do happen. It would be enough to give them a firm, a firm, um, firm belief. Yeah. So I think this is what you're, you're kind of saying, right? And I, I, I take it, yeah. Like you're saying, there's some, some kind of cause that caused them to have a bodily rest belief. Yes. That in turn yes. caused them to invent the empty tomb and res appearances. So, gotcha. Yeah. We would. Okay. Cool. We can, we can get into that uh, next time. Okay. Um, Good. Right, All right. And the, the, and the embarrassment. Well, yes. It, it, it is. It is an argument. But if, if they, um. If the gospel authors were really clued into this, you know what would be embarrassing to the to the Jews, uh, embarrassing to their cause, then um, they they could have inserted the story about the women having um, uh, seen the empty tomb first as a kind of counter counter argument. So yeah, see why you know it, it's credible because it, it it would be embarrassing for us for the women to see the tomb first. Exactly what you're saying here. So that would be an apologetic argument. But then, of course, it's taken away uh, or corrected, if you like, with the men coming along and then confirming it afterwards. So, you know, it's not so it's not so bad after all. If it was just the women only, then then uh, you might think that they 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 the authors would have a, a problem. But uh, but the men see it after the women. But you could say the women first is just, you know, like a double bluff. Can I? OK, so just one last follow up question on this. And, and as I promised, but. So is it your contention that the early disciples engaged in modern apologetics arguments employing criteria, historical criteria for authenticity that, that, from my knowledge, didn't exist in the first century, like they were ahead of their time kind of thing? Well, I mean, if it was embarrassing, you know, I mean, I, the, the, they, the, the people who wrote the Gospels were, were quite, you know, were, were literate. I don't believe that they were the, you know, the, the actual disciples whose names there are Matthew and and and, and John but um, they were literate clever people it's not impossible that they could put things in to make their argument better by various ways and if they knew what would be really embarrassing they could have stuck it in there um, just as a counter 
But I'm not saying I believe that. I'm just saying it's an alternative hypothesis. Okay. All right, cool. Yeah. Well, yeah, like I said, as promised, I know you're running low on time. So I'm. let's save. That was great. Let's save. Uh, let's continue this next time and go over some of the, the other stuff that uh, we missed as well. I, I would like you next time, before we uh, return to some of the stuff that we need to you know, finish the loose ends on, do you also have evidence, negative evidence, that you think disproves the empty tomb? Um, maybe why don't you lay out a case if you think there are some arguments that disprove. So I know Gary Habermas, he thinks there are about 14 arguments that disprove, by skeptics that disprove the empty tomb. So yeah, if, if you want to lay out a case of about five, three or five or something like that uh, as well, um, I'd like to see, do you think there are any disproofs or is it you just think the positive evidence we have is not good enough? No, that's right. No, I, I think it's just uh, at this distance, we're talking about 2000 years and and at the, all the evidence we have are texts that were written some years after the event. Uh, are they enough to warrant positive belief in the events they record? And uh, in the case of uh, in the case of an, something that uh, and if you like a naturalistic event, then um, it's possible that we might accept those records as being, you know, proof, uh, of, if not proof, at least reasonable to believe the events they record happened. But in the case of when we get onto a, a, an alleged miracle, then I think, you know, along with Hume, that we re need really, really strong evidence there. And I don't think we have it, but that's getting on to the resurrection, which we hopefully we'll talk next time oh it, it'll it won't be next time it'll it'll be several shows away probably okay all right so I'm established, I'm established, hopefully we'll get there. the method we'll get there. Done, i'm step by step establishing the historical the relevant historical facts uh right uh, that i think we can prove then we're going to get to the explanatory level mm -hmm. there's a method to my madness if you don't see it uh, okay. there's a systematic uh, thing behind what i'm doing so. okay <laughs> All right, you're, you're going to wear me down, Dale, aren't you? <laughs> Very well. well I've been, uh, all right, cool. So, yeah, thank you so much for coming on. I, I hope this was helpful in starting to get you to see that, look, I'm, I'm not just all number random numbers and talk. I, I've got objective reasoning behind why I say what I say or why I believe certain things are facts or stuff like that. So you're, you're starting to get a glimpse with this empty tomb, first and foremost, that I've got reasons, even if you disagree with them, I, mm -hmm. I've got objective reasons that you can consider and I can consider and stuff like that. Right. So, yeah, that's right. That, that, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. Staying off the numbers. It's good to hear those reasons, see them, think about them. And uh, I'll read the article that uh, you, you recommend and uh, we'll come back and have another go. Sounds good. All right. Well, thank you so much, uh, David, for being here and happy Easter to, to everyone, uh, Ringo cat and, Mr. Jetty in the audience, I saw you guys. So happy Easter to all and to all a good night. All right. Bye then. <laughs>